Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to week two. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, the Digital Forensic Lab and the basic guide in creating a Digital Forensic Lab. So Digital Forensics is an exacting process that involves the use of proper tools, techniques, and knowledge in order to extract potential evidence from the systems. Um, it's imperative that digital forensic examiners uh, have a specific location to do the examination and the acquisition uh, separate from normal business operations. So you don't want to be at your desk being able to do the processing in the acquisition and then reach over and do um, some emails and such. Um, that is high probability of, um, of evidence contamination. So this is where a digital forensic lab comes in. It should have several key features um, that ensure the examiner has not only the necessary privacy to do the examination, but also ensure the integrity of the evidence remains while it's being examined. So some of the key features would include physical security. Uh, this consists of, of three things, controlled access, evidence lockers, and controlled climate and humidity. Access to the lab needs to be strictly controlled. Um, this is to maintain the chain of custody. So only those that have a need to be in the lab or allowed to be in the lab should be in the lab. Uh, this limits the necessary chances of the evidence being tampered or destroyed. Um, controlled access would also include access cards or key fobs. Um, this can help build a complete reconstruction of all personnel who access the lab within specific timeframes. Next, we have evidence lockers. Those are ideal for um, to keep the evidence properly stored. Um, they should also be secured with either an onboard lock with a key or a combination lock. The reason for this is because you want to be able to have the separation of your cases. And they don't need to be um, you know, those metal gym lockers, but they can be um, other storage methods, such as um, those wiry gates, but also that banker boxes can also be used. Those should be temporary uh, types of storage for your evidence, but as long as you can keep all that evidence separated from different cases and be able to put labels on and have your chain of custody taped on there for easy access and easy uh, signing and out, um, it shouldn't be uh, too complicated. Uh, next, we have the climate and humidity controller. Uh, these need to be controlled such in a way that any data center is controlled. The reason being is that when you're in a little room with uh, multiple workstations, either doing acquisitions, processing, examining, multiple bodies in there, and then you on top of that, you have like either a NAS that contains all of your data, your um, your evidence, it can get pretty hot in there. So make sure you have um, airflow and it's properly controlled. The reason being is because if it gets too hot in there, it can lead to hardware failure. And we don't want that while you're completing a process. The next thing is tools, specifically for hardware. Um, you have your forensic workstations. These are used to perform the imaging of hard drives, processing large amounts of data. The workstation should have sufficient RAM and processing power. And the workstation should be set up with a hard drive containing the operating system and other tools that you'll use to perform the tasks and a secondary drive uh, to hold evidence. Note that it's to hold it, not to store it. Um, holding the evidence ensures that you're able to have to, to complete the verification process to make sure that the data that has been copied, uh, the integrity is intact. And then once that has been verified, then you can store it somewhere uh, such as a NAS. And then if you want to go further than that, for depending on your retention policies are, uh, you can then move it from the NAS to a more permanent storage such as tapes. Along with the workstation, the lab should also have a research workstation with an internet connection to conduct research or to write reports. The forensic workstation should never be open to the internet. You should never be able to access your workstation, your forensic workstation from your home. Um, 
And then you have your physical rate blockers. Uh, physical rate blockers or just rate blockers are critical to digital forensic labs. This device, uh, sometimes they're little, these little tableaus, um, allow for a connection between the hard drive that has been seized or the endpoint or the mobile phone that has been seized and the forensic imaging machine. The difference between this physical write blocker and just a regular USB plugging in the phone or plugging in the hard drive um, means that the digital forensics examiner can be sure that there's no data being written to the evidence drive. So the little tableaus that you'd find uh, within those labs create a block. Uh, once they've one end is plugged into the evidence as the source, the other end is plugged into the workstation, the forensic workstation as a destination, and it's turned on, it removes the ability for the forensic workstation for any data to pass over to that hard drive, it means that it keeps the integrity of that hard drive. The same thing goes with any of those phone mobile ones, uh, such as Celebrate UFED has uh, a really cool kit uh, to do mobile forensics that allows uh, that type of transfer to, to happen. Next, we have uh, the software within your digital forensic lab. You can choose any software that you want. You can either go with paid or open source. Um, forensic applications specifically, we have Autopsy, uh, there's NCASE, uh, FTK Imager, X-Waves, Magnet Axiom, Mandiant Redline, Celebrate UFED. Uh, Autopsy and Redline are open source, they're free. The rest of them have paid uh, grades depending on how, uh, uh, what packages you want essentially and what type of forensics you wanna do. Um, and then you need to make sure that you have tools that are specific to operating system based. So NCASE does a really good job with Windows not a very good job uh, with uh, Mac. However, you have Celebrate who just purchased Blackbag, who does a really good job with, with uh, Macintosh operating systems. And Magnet Axiom is also really good with either or. Um, but if you want something free and specifically um, operating system based, you can utilize these other ones. Uh, Paladin is really good. You have the SIF, which is created by SANS. Uh, it is free. It's in application, actually, OWA. You can uh, sign up and download it for free, utilize it. It comes with a slew of tools. It's awesome. Kane is also really good. I use Kane uh, as a bootable USB drive. So you plug it in and it boots up into Kane and you can create a uh, full either a logical acquisition or a bit by bit acquisition, so an exact copy. So depending on what you wanna do and what type of digital forensics you wanna conduct will depend on which application and also which operating system-based software that you'll use. Next is uh, jump kits. Jump kits are super cool to have. They're not necessarily not necessary within your digital forensic lab, but they are useful, especially if you need to go on site uh, do, and do a, an acquisition or, a, um, uh, or an examination of something really quick. Um, so these jump kits are super useful. They consist of a forensic laptop that has the tools necessary the, uh, and the operating system is up to date, as well as network cables for you to plug in if you need to. Um, physical write blockers, so those little tableaus. External USB hard drives, so hard drives that are used to store or just hold the data, essentially, uh, that's able to plug into the USB of your laptop. Um, external USB drives as well. Bootable USB drive, uh, such as the Kane application that I told you about, that's really useful to have on a USB. Um, evidence bags or boxes, a way for you to be able to carry um, all the evidence that you're seizing. Anti-static bags, if you are seizing, um, let's say hard drive uh, that you've taken out of a laptop or a desktop, uh, you need to put into anti-static bag uh, to protect it. Chain of custody forms, uh, as soon as you are handling evidence, if you are seizing it, uh, you need to complete that chain of custody form as well. Toolkit, a toolkit is kind of like a, um, 
on the go little either USB or a hard drive that you can plug into a workstation or a uh, laptop and run several tools to be able to either capture RAM really quickly, uh, capture a triage or a live acquisition. Uh, sometimes you can use Redline to do that. You can use the magnet uh, RAM capture, both free utilities, um, and then other types of tools that you can utilize fairly quickly before um, the computer is shut down and brought back to, to the lab to be processed and, and acquired um, fully as a, as a full physical um, acquisition. And then of course, a notepad. Notepads are super handy because then um, if you are coming up upon the scene and there's a laptop that's open, that's just a cracked screen, you note that down, you make sure that you know exactly where that laptop was located within the, within the room that you've seen it in. And then anything that you note down of interest that has been open on the laptop before performing any of your uh, forensic tasks. So those are, that's really useful. One thing I didn't add here are um, bare day bags. So if you go onto the scene and you need to acquire a uh, cell phone, uh, cell phones should have um, their Wi-Fi disabled as well as their, um, their cellular data disabled. And uh, if you can't do that, because there are some uh, mobile devices where you require either a pin, thumbprint, or, or face recognition in order to go into those settings before applying um, those uh, to remove those types of communications, putting it into a Fara for Faraday bag will cut off that network, cut off those signals. Um, this prevents any attempts of remote wiping. And then last but not least, here are some resources that you can look into. So Interpol has a global guideline for digital forensic laboratories. And then digital forensics processing and procedures, um, that is a really thick book, um, but I suggest reading into it um, mainly because it does really dive into details about digital forensic lab, such as, um, for example, uh, the way the, wa the wall should be built, the way the wire should come in, what type of air circulation, the different types of control access that you can have, the different types of, of uh, data storage in there. It, it really, really dives in, but it's, it's also um, gives you some pretty good ideas of what you can, like how far you wanna take it or how a simple lab uh, can be created. And of course, NIST ha also has um, some really good guidelines as well. So I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, feel free to comment underneath in the classroom. And then uh, the following, the next video that we'll be doing is uh, just an introduction to actually doing some of the labs. Um, and so I hope you're enjoying everything and uh, find some value in it. Thanks.